Hey Slasher fans, welcome to another commentary from Steve and Kevin. Yeah, today we are with you guys. We're going to be watching the Wes Craven classic Scream from 1996. Uh, it's kind of funny. We've done four commentaries so far. Three of them have been for Wes Craven films. I didn't realize that till day until uh, we were uh, kind of doing our tally. But yeah, uh, three of the four commentaries we've done were for Wes Craven films. Uh, the other ones we did were Sleepaway Camp, People Under the Stairs, and also A Nightmare on Elm Street, which A Nightmare on Elm Street was the very first one we did. So, yeah, we are going to be watching this movie with you guys. So, yeah, I uh, hope you guys have a good time with this. Uh, it's one of our favorites, so we can't wait to start talking to you guys about it. So, on the count of three, we want you guys to press play with it. And if you guys are not um, watching it live, we're pretty much going to be describing some of it that happens on the screen, too. So, uh, you don't have to worry about that. So on uh, three, one, two, three, play the movie now. All right, yeah, that, that's funny that we have uh, three Wes Craven films already, already kind of <clears throat> in the bag. I don't know if that says something about us or Wes Craven or, or uh, just kind of the whole thing, but um, that's it's very cool. So And uh, Scream is one of my favorites. I know it's one of Kevin's favorites as well. And oddly enough, I mean, me and Kevin have been watching movies back and forth together for years and years. This is the first time we've ever watched Scream together, which is kind of bizarre. Yeah, it is a little bizarre. Um, I will do a little bit of a warning for you guys that if you guys are playing this in your DVD, it started with the Dimension logo right away. If you guys played it on Blu-ray, there was a little bit of a delay. So we're watching it on Blu-ray, so we might be uh, maybe 30 seconds ahead of those watching it on <laughs> DVD right now. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about The Scream. This was the second horror movie that I saw in the theater. I saw them both the same year. The first one that I saw was The Frighteners, which was the summer of 1996. And this opened, I don't even have to look it up. I already know it right away. On December 20th, 1996, it made $6.3 million opening weekends. It placed, I believe it was fourth place at the box office. It stayed in the box office top 10 for nearly six months. It was still in the top 10 when it was released the following June. And the sequel had even started production before the original was out on video. This was before the, D the days of DVD, before the days of Blu-ray. So this was kind of the movie that just kept on growing, made six million opening weekend, nine million second weekend, 10 million third weekend, and it ended up grossing $103 million just in the United States, which adjusted for inflation is around 180 today, which is just absolutely incredible. I, This is kind of the movie that was just lightning in a bottle and the kind of word-of-mouth hit that would never happen today. Yeah, it is It is crazy. It pretty much has you know everything. It hits, hits in all cylinders. I mean, it's got an awesome director. Um, the score, the cast, the editing, um, just the action that happens within the film. Um, everything is, is pretty much flawless for the most part. Um, and so the first scene is one of my favorite beginnings to any movie. We have Drew Barrymore on the phone. She's making the popcorn. And I've said it before, and I'll, I'll say it again. I mean, this, this could easily, easily um, be its own standalone short. Um, so, I mean, most filmmakers would excuse the pun, die to make a short like this and get entered in the film film festivals. And, I mean, this would easily go go over well at um, the festivals and the, the whole fest circuit, I guess. So, But, yeah, I just, I just love the beginning because it, it plays up the suspense. We got some action. And it's just it's so much well, so well done. I love the filmmaking, uh, the camera work, I guess, as the camera follows Drew around the house and, you gotta love Drew in this scene too. I mean, I kind of fell in love with her from ET, so we got a little soft spot for her. Yeah, Drew is absolutely amazing in this movie. Uh, something that you guys might know, maybe you don't. I think it's pretty common knowledge that uh, they originally wanted Drew to play the role of Sydney Prescott. She was busy at the time filming um, Woody Allen's um, uh, "Everybody Says I Love You." And she wasn't able to do both films, but she still wanted to work on this one in a, the smaller part. And she really wanted to do the part of uh, Casey Becker. And yeah, it, this was a five-day shoot for her. Very cold, um, miserable. Uh, they 
did whatever they could. Uh, I know they mentioned this in the West Craven commentary that to get her to cry, they he would mention these stories about these dogs being um, mutilated and being set on fire because <laughs> she's an avid animal lover, and that got her to cry and really kind of go there for each of the scenes. But it takes a lot for an actress to, especially only working with a director for, for, for a few days like that, to really kind of put her um, faith and trust in the director. So I think that says a lot about Wes. Hmm, yeah, that, that's interesting. You know, it's just to think of where this movie would have went and, you know, the franchise as well if if Drew would have been our, our Sydney. Where do you think the, the franchise would have went, Kevin? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. I honestly, I, I don't know. Um, you know, there, if you look online, there's a million people that auditioned for the role of Sydney Prescott. I know one of them that they mentioned was Selma Blair, who, uh, she was, I believe she was one of the, kind of the, the runners up, if you will. And Wes felt bad about not giving her the part. So he ended up giving her the role in Scream 2. She's the voice on the phone that talks to Sarah Marshall Geller uh, right before she's about to get killed. So, you know, if she had been Sydney, this movie would have been a lot different. Uh, this movie really went through kind of hell with pre-production. It was the script. It was originally called Scary Movie, written by Kevin Williamson. And it went through every single studio, every single director, Nobody wanted to do it because everyone thought at this time that horror movies were really dead. And for the most part, they were right. I mean, horror movies just were not bringing in the big bucks. Uh, they were kind of seen as has-been, especially the slasher genre. There hadn't been a big slasher hit since the 80s. And I mean, this was released in 96. So, I mean, six years is a long, long time when it comes to filmmaking. So what do you think it was about this particular film that caught the attention of so many moviegoers? Do you think it was... You know, maybe part of the cast, something to do with the overall filmmaking, the look of the film, or was it all in the marketing, just getting people in the seats? Well, I think the marketing was really good by Dimension. I think that they did a great job of selling this film and kind of playing up the comedy while also playing up the scares. I think word of mouth really helped. I think, you know, there there's all these elements to this, but this was kind of the first meta self-aware horror movie where the teenagers in it talked about other horror movies and i don't want to say this is the first you know you can name many other horror movies like from the 80s where they mention other horror films but this they kind of took it to the next level where they played with the audience's expectations of what was going to happen with the scare and i think that the teens at this point is and i was one of them i really appreciated the fact that this was a horror movie that really treated its audience with intelligence and didn't talk down to that audience. Yeah, I mean, so much goes goes into this movie that all meshes well. Like you mentioned, you know, the horror aspects and the comedy aspects, which are awesome. And then we have, you know, some great lines like, what's your favorite scary movie? I mean, that became such a, you know, pop culture phenomenon. I mean, I couldn't imagine, you know, not knowing that line. Yeah, I mean, it's really crazy just in the fact that, uh, you know, in the script there wasn't even, there wasn't even a, a mask or there wasn't, uh, you know, we just think automatically scream with ghost face, you know, and that just happened to be a costume that they found in one of the house that they were location scouting at. And they took that mask and they kind of ran with it and decided who got, who owned the rights to it. They used the mask and we were able to get the rights and... I don't think this would have worked with another character, with another um, mask or kind of um, costume uniform. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so iconic. I mean, back in the 80s, we had a lot of, um, you know, the top-notch villains that became, you know, popular Halloween costumes. Jason, Michael, Freddy, and um, Ghostface kind of, kind of took that over. And has there been anything since Scream that was kind of this huge Halloween costume. I'm trying to think. I can't think of one. Um, no, I don't think so. I think Scream was really the last. I mean, there was like little little bits and pieces here and there. Like I think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 
remake kind of brought back Leatherface a little bit. I think that some people dressed up as kind of like the Jigsaw puzzle. I meant um, the Jigsaw puppet um, from Saw. But besides that, um, yeah, little little things here and there, but nothing that became uh, a phenomenon within that market because this was really the last huge slasher hit. There were other ones like I Know Jill Summer and Urban Legend, but they were never to this extreme. Mm-hmm. So we're getting a little action here now. We've got the smoke in the in the kitchen. Um, Drew's got the knife and the phone. And uh, we're getting, uh, getting into a little suspense here. Kevin, do you remember the first time you watched this? And I remember getting sucked in right away. How about you? Um, I saw this at the theater. I was with my mom and my cousin. <laughs> and we were the only three in the theater the first, wow, the first time I saw it. Um, and I saw this three times in the theater. Um, it's really funny because that was the first time I saw it. It was just the three of us. And then this was this was opening weekend. And then I saw it two weeks later with friends and it had sold out. Mm-hmm. I can't even describe how much that would never, ever, ever happen today. First of all, if there's three people in the theater that opening weekend, that second week, I guarantee you that theater is probably going to be down to one showing. And by the third weekend, it's going to be out of there. There's no time to build word of mouth today. But... I, I just, you know, this became this cultural event, which I still remember being in, I believe it was eighth grade math class. It was algebra. And these girls behind me just talking about the movie and how, talking about how scary it was and how they really wanted to see it again. And it was it was insane. I mean, that was something that this really became at least for my generation, that I saw the first word of mouth, this movie defines my generation type movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember, I remember watching this for the first time too. You know, we were um, a couple friends, my brother, we all got together and uh, put this movie in the, the VHS player and we uh, attempted to watch this and we, we did and um, Did you get scared? I, I didn't get scared. You no, got there scared. Was a, there was a parent that wasn't too too thrilled about it, though, but we still ended up watching it. And um, I remember loving it the first very first time. And um, I remember going over to my friend's house and watching this on VHS, and his mom was not happy. <laughs> it was towards the end, and she looks at the TV, and she just does a sigh, and she's like, they sure do like to say that F word. <laughs> And that's what I remember most about watching that with my friend. And that we, I tried to go with him to see Scream 2. And his mom called the theater with a description of what he looked like oh and told God. him. I mean, we were like 15, 16 at this time. I mean, we weren't like little kids. And said that, you know, no, you're not allowed to sell him a movie ticket to see this. So. I'd already seen Scream 2 by that point, so we ended up seeing Home Alone 3 instead. <laughs> Home Alone 3? <laughs> Home Alone 3 is fine, but I would have rather seen Scream 2 again. Wow, what a what a crazy turn of events your night took. I don't think your mom would have been happy with how many <laughs> times they said the F word either. That could have been your mom. It could have. It could have. <laughs> Has your mom seen this? Not that I know of. I don't think so. Um... I, I am lucky to say and I'm proud to say that I've seen all four Scream movies in the theater at least one time with my parents. Uh, my mom went to see the, yeah, all four of them with me. And she even went to see two and three. She saw those two times each. So she is a big Scream fan as well. Uh, she really likes kind of solving the murder mystery, mm. which I think is that's that's a big part of the charm of these movies. Mm-hmm. I, I think so as well. Um, so we get kind of a gruesome gruesome look here, and a lot of kind of unique camera work here. I mean, we have that super kind of fast paced zoom up onto the hanging Drew. There's a couple Dutch angles there with the uh, the parents, and then when Drew is on the on the ground as well, so it's it's very unique and eye catching as well. So, so there's a little bit of controversy of people that either it's something that they don't remember or something that they're mistakenly remembered. But there are some people that saw Scream in the theater that are positive 
the title card of Scream came after Drew Barrymore hanging, which it goes to black, so I could see it happening. I honestly don't remember either way. I would ask you, Steve, you didn't see it in the theater, though. So I'm curious, the people that are listening, if there are people out there that can for sure say that, yes, the title card in the theater was after Drew Barrymore's death, or if it was always right when that phone rings right at the beginning. So that's kind of one of those kind of urban legends online. That... Sure. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up because I was actually thinking that while we were watching this first but I, scene. I don't know why they would have changed it. I don't either, but it's weird because um, I, for whatever reason, always thought it came after that scene as well, and then not till recently when I, so I guess, you, watched it. Do you notice her bear is kind of like... Do you have one of those? A little while ago that it, it comes first. Um, what bear? That little tiger? The tiger? I don't have that tiger. Did you listen to Indigo Girls? <laughs> I, did, I didn't, and nor did I have a poster. So, Steve, you want to talk about Nev Campbell's nightgown? It's it's nice. It's it's sultry. I can see why there's a lot of lust and, and sexual tension going on right now. Um yeah, kind of curious on the wardrobe choice here. I mean, I guess it is an it's a way to make her a little more proper and keep her from being like I guess the Tatum character. Um, yeah, she's kind of the good girl. Yeah, it's it's you know we first hear in the ponytail <laughs> like it's very you know clean cut. Yes. So. And then we got Skeet Ulrich who is. You know, they've said it a million times. I'm going to say it again here. He's kind of the Johnny Depp of this movie. Um, there's something almost classic about his look. Yeah. Although I don't particularly like the the cuffs on the the polo. The um, cuffs on the polo. I haven't noticed. I I don't know how to describe that. Let me or see. like the where the the sleeves get tight at the bottom. <laughs> Would you call that cuffs? Do you know what I'm talking about? Right there in the polo sleeve? Like at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, like they're they're like cuffs. Sure. Um, I don't think that you would have that today, but for the most part, he could easily be wearing that same outfit with that same hair today. Maybe not quite as greasy, but and I it'd be more messy and not slick back, but he's got some good cheekbones. There you go. But no, it, he's definitely got a distinct look. That is perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. It's very, um, he looks boy next door slightly, kind of the the rebel boy next mm-hmm. door who, you know, he looks like he'd be a nice guy, but there's something about him that maybe there's more to him than what meets the eye. Mm-hmm. So Kevin, did you ever sneak into anybody's window at night? Um, snuck out of some windows. Snuck out of some windows. Okay. Um, snuck into some windows. I'm not gonna say no, because <laughs> I I don't remember. Uh, have you? I've snuck into my own window before. As far as going to somebody else's window, no. It's always it's always kind of a cool thing you see in the in TV and the movies, like uh. The bad boy sitting in the windows and all this stuff, and but no, I've never, never done it. Never had to, I guess. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure that I probably have. I know, I know for a fact that I've snuck out of, of two windows before. <laughs> um, so we're coming up to the school. There's the awesome shot here too. Yeah, I love this too. Um, and then the classic '90s fashion <laughs> of wearing the the flannel tied around the the waist. <laughs> Here we get the little cameo in the background with Linda Blair. Hmm. And we're coming up to everyone's favorite Uber bitch, Gail <laughs> Weathers, played wonderfully by Courtney Cox, who had to fight and claw and chew for this role. She absolutely wanted it. Hmm. Uh, the producers just saw her from Friends, weren't sure if she was going to be evil enough. Originally, the they wanted Janine Garofalo, who turned the movie down because she thought the script was too violent. She's gone on record as saying that it's one of the only career decisions that she regrets, hmm. and she didn't realize how funny the movie was until she actually saw it on screen. 
Whoa, so, that's pretty um, cool. I didn't, I didn't know that, but yeah, a, know, she named nice. Garofalo. It would have been a completely different character, I think. I think yeah. it would have been. A, I, I think it still would have worked. I think it would have been a lot darker. It definitely wouldn't have been as comedic, especially in like Scream Three. No, with, uh, I think it would have been a little too harsh, actually. I mean, we wouldn't have known any different, but it, it, I, th it would have been interesting to see. I think that the contrast between the good girl and her might have, you know, that might have sparked more of the jealousy i think but um yeah it's yeah it's one of those things that you know we're, we're, we're never gonna know we can just speculate and guess but and then we have the fonz hey what do you think about about him it's, it's i always found that kind of a an odd choice to kind of cast him i don't know how or where well, they he ended must up? Must be a with... really good sport because he kind of <laughs> makes fun of his image here, and yeah. he's also, I mean, for those fans of Arrested Development, he's more than willing to make fun <laughs> of himself on that. Uh, so it's really crazy, is that so? David Arquette plays Tate on Rose McGowan's older brother, who's the cop here. I remember as a kid thinking, "Oh yeah, like he's not that young as a cop." Now when I watch this and I'm older, I'm like, he's 25 and he's a cop. Like, that seems so young to hmm. me. And I guess that's one of those things where you, you don't realize how much perception can change as you grow older. Yeah, definitely. That's always, that's all, age is always very weird. It's, it's a different kind of milestones to your life. So, again, with a great 90s fashion, we have uh, a lot of striped shirts and sweaters going on here. Stuff you don't see much anymore. Uh, I had a lot of these very long, <laughs> baggy sweaters with kind of the, the big necks. Um, a lot of, like, it was almost like that, like, I don't even know the, the material. It was almost like a, like a velvety. Like, I remember getting a lot of my shirts from Kohl's, which I, I would not be... I would not doubt if that's where a lot of these fashions <laughs> came from. Nothing against it. I mean, that was just kind of where, where 90s happened. Uh, so, yeah, these are kind of the the teens of Woodsboro. Um, one thing that's kind of never touched on, and I'll, I'll ask you for kind of your your thoughts on this, Steve. It's like, do you think that this is a popular group? Are they kind of loners? We never kind of get the the kind of idea of how they fit in with the rest of these students yeah that's actually a really good question i don't know if i've ever like i've always assumed that casey was the popular girl and like we find out that she broke up with the max Lillard character and i i always kind of picture this in my head and i don't know if you feel this way but like i always felt like that she wasn't as popular and then she got popular and then she broke up with him and that's why he got mad mm. that's kind of just the backstory that i played in my head <clears throat> So I'd be curious, those of you guys out there, and you too, Steve, like, what you think of that backstory? Yeah, I guess that that's very possible. I guess, like I said, I don't think I've ever really thought too much into it. Um, they've all just kind of been in their own kind of realm for me within the school. But I guess now kind of taking a step back, I don't think they were the most popular kids. I mean, we don't really have any of the jocks, the the – quarterback and the the prom queen i don't think tatum was really going to be taking that crown she could but um that no, poor I think girl on the bus she says see you tomorrow <laughs> said sid doesn't even say anything she doesn't care she just wants to go home i love the house mm -hmm. it's a good house good good backdrop too look at those the hills and mountains <laughs> back there yeah look at look at that deck, it's a that, good deck, looking deck. that deck is bigger than my apartment So you still have some of those kind of oversized sweatshirts, don't you? Not like that. No, you I have one I almost would. exactly like that. It's like a Wisconsin one. I don't. I don't own a Wisconsin one. I used to have a red one. No, you have a gray one. That's Wisconsin something. I think it's like a Packers one. Wisconsin something, a Packers one. I think it is. Um, I I have a gray Packers sweatshirt. Yeah, I think that's like it. That. It's kind of oversized. It's got no, a big it's actually neck. tight. No. I remember it having a big neck. Uh, so one thing that I think still works about Scream really well, even today, is that the pacing, there's always something going on. There's always something happening with the characters, always something with the kind of the, just everything that's, that's happening. 
uh, we, we get a good idea right of way of who Sydney Prescott is. And here we kind of get the backstory of why she doesn't like Gail Weathers because Gail Weathers has pretty much been making money off of her and the story of her mother who died. Coincidentally, one year ago, this very same week. So I got to do a shout out to Gail Weathers. A lot of people love her. And I'm going to mention a couple of people right now on our show. Uh, Zachary Allen loves Gail. Uh, Gail is his spirit animal. Um, Andrew also is a big fan. And Ferdy and James. And I guess the list could just go on and on and on. There, I feel like there's so many people that... They say, yes, Gail is my favorite character. There's people that like Sydney. There's people that like Dewey. There's people that like Randy. Although I will be completely honest and say that I've never been the biggest Randy fan. I know that as a horror geek and just somebody who loves the genre to death, Randy should be a character that I cherish. For whatever reason, he just kind of got underneath my skin. I've always found him to be slightly obnoxious. So when he ends up dying halfway through two, a lot of fans are really pissed off and said, you know, bring Randy back. And they actually do bring him back for the cameo in Scream 3. I think I was pretty much fine with it. I think that Randy kind of had his 15 minutes in the series. There really wasn't anything to do with that. And we're going to talk about it more next week when we do our commentary for Scream 2. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they they had to kind of up the stakes. And if they they wouldn't have killed one of the originals in Scream 2, I think that, you know, fans would have just said, okay, well, we're just kind of seeing the same movie over again. And they, they kill one of the originals in Scream 2. At the beginning of Scream 3, Cotton dies, so they're killing off one of the originals there. And Scream 4 is actually the only one of the three sequels in which somebody from the original film is not killed. So which of the four movies do you think that Campbell looks the best at? I don't, I've always kind of been partial to her in the first one. I've always had a always had a thing for the uh teenage girls. <laughs> I, I, I caught myself. I didn't know where to go from there. I was going to say young Nev Campbell, but... She's you know, aged really well. She I has. will say that 50, um, has it Was it 15? Yeah, 15 years later for Scream 4, she still looks... No, is it... Why can't I even think? 96, 15... Yeah, 15 years later. She looks really good. Yeah, she she still looks good. She looks great. Um, like you said, aged very well. and I haven't seen... What's Tatum look like nowadays? Um, Rose McGowan unfortunately got in a car accident, so she had to get some work done to her oh, face. Oh, no. Um, so, I mean, I think she still looks good. You know, she's she's hanging in there. So, you know, I, I will always love Rose McGowan for this film and also for, for Jawbreaker. You know, she's a great, you know, and there's also people who loved her also for Charm. So, you know, she's definitely somebody who's kind of stuck with the horror genre. Hmm. So according to IMDb, and we kind of have to take these uh, trivia by with a grain of salt because anyone can post this stuff, but it says, during production, Ghostface's signature black robe was going to be white to make him appear even more like a ghost. This was changed in fear of people comparing the costume to those worn by the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> I can see that. Whether that's true <laughs> or not, I don't know. That's, I think, the first time that I've heard that. Hmm. So, Kevin, have you? I'm sure you probably have. You ever done the what's your favorite scary movie prank to anybody on the phone? I don't think so, but I know that I bought you. I got it from Goodwill, and it was like the the voice changer box. <laughs> really? That's the only place I ever had it. They only had it there for like a month, and then I think they recalled them for whatever reason. Huh. And it kind of worked. It kind of changed your voice, but like. Pretty much you could hear your own voice and then like there'd be like a two second delay and then you'd hear like the, the ghost face voice say the same thing. Okay. So it didn't really work. 
Uh, did you have the ghost face costume? I have had a few masks. I never had the whole get up, but I had the just the original mask. I had the one where it pumps the blood. I think I had kind of like a glow in the dark one as well. So I was huge in the go the ghost face mask back in the day. Um, I actually scared my cousin. Uh, she was she went in to use the bathroom, and I was in the whole costume, and I was in the I was in the shower, and then I ripped the shower open and scared her to death. <laughs> Poor girl. So what is your take on kind of the almost stupid, clumsy ghost face, I guess? I like it. I think it's fairly realistic. You know, there's not going to be, especially in a costume like that, like anyone who's worn that costume, it's bulky. It's hard to run in. It's, it's almost like wearing a dress. <laughs> like it's hard to see through it. Like it's, it's not easy. So I still remember from, uh, the, the trailer, the scene went on a little longer and she gets on the computer and it's more of this, um, typing back and forth, the 911, what is your emergency? I don't even know how this would really work. Like, I'm trying to think back in the day, back in 1996. Like, was there internet? Like, <laughs> I mean, I guess there would have had to have been, but, like, what is she typing on? Like, how does she get connected? Like, I don't know. There's so many questions. And if there is internet, like, she was just on the phone. Like, she didn't hang up. Like, this had to have been dial tone era. Like, I, I don't know. There's a lot of... Um, questions i guess yeah i wouldn't think of you know back then that uh there had been like a an online chat for for 911 maybe there maybe there was i don't know it does seem i don't think there i i would assume <coughs> there was not but so one thing that i'm sure that people do know but uh drew and nev uh roger jackson does the voice of ghostface and he made sure that they didn't meet him until after their scenes were done because they wanted it to be extra scary and they didn't know who the voice was and they actually recorded the, the sound live on set. Hmm. Uh, more trivia. Um, this movie had to... This movie took nine times to go to the MPAA before they were given an R rating. It kept on getting an NC-17. Wow. They didn't like the final scene. They kept cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it. And... Uh, yeah, uh, Bob Weinstein eventually talked to the MPA, said this is a comedy, not a horror film, and then all of a sudden they had an R rating. Sure. So maybe they didn't get the comedy. <laughs> I don't think they get much. Uh, more trivia from IMDb. Uh, being a favorite of writer Kevin Williamson, Molly Ringwald was offered the role of Sydney, but turned it down, saying she'd rather not play a high school student at the age of 27. <laughs> Once again, whether the, whether or not this is true, I don't know, but who knows? And more cops. We talked about we talked about this last week, the kind of cop theme with uh, Wes Craven, and here we have a whole slew of cops now. Yeah, so here we get kind of Courtney Cox's first real big scene with her clumsy, fat cameraman <laughs> Kenny. So who would you be in this movie? Do you think you'd be Kenny? No, you'd probably be Kenny. No. <laughs> I'd be there at the camera right away. <laughs> yeah, Courtney Cox just has such a great bitch face. Like She just pulls off this character so well. I still think today this is her best character work. You know, I know that she played Monica Geller for 10 years on Friends. Um... I, I like Gail Weathers even more. Yeah, it's all around really good casting, I think. And, you know, there's so many films where, you know, there's maybe one or two or even more than that where you get these actors playing these characters where you just you just don't believe them. It's not believable. But I think this is well well done all around. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's none of these parts that I think are miscast. I think that they're all... Uh, really good characters, and I think these actors really bring them to life. Mm -hmm. I guess the role of Sydney was offered to Reese Witherspoon, who turned it down, who said she'd rather not do horror. Oh, interesting.
so yeah, it's just, it's so crazy to think today, you know, so many years later, and it's so just insane to think that Scream's going to be 18 years old this year, but uh, just how much has changed technology-wise? I mean, we have the internet now, we have, you know, here, you know, cellular telephone, like, that just, that sounds so antiquated, like, who, like, no one would ever say it like that today. I know, even now when I hear people say cell phone, that's even weird, because now I think it's just to the point where it's, it's just a phone now, so it's no, nobody, I won't say nobody, but, you know, majority of the landlines are a thing of the past now, as far as being in a house. Do you have and a landline? I, I don't, I don't, I don't, there's no reason to really to have a landline anymore, it's far as what i can tell but um but yeah that's even cell phone now is kind of a a term do your that parents might be still have out. a landline they do but they don't they're thinking about getting rid of it because they both have cell phones so my parents both have cell phones too but for some reason they like the they have the landline i don't know if it's something that's comforting or you know uh you know what if for whatever reason the cell phone's not working blah blah blah, blah but yeah, I mean, I think that we might be the first generation that really, as adults, grow up not needing to have the the landline telephone. Yeah, my parents don't even answer. Like, if I call the landline, they won't answer. And then I call the cell, and they'll, they'll answer. It's like, oh, we don't answer that. Because to them, all it is is just telemarketers calling that phone number. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool – I always like that part, too, where they – they had the costume packaging uh-huh. for uh, for Ghostface. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I don't kind think of, uh, we see the costume packaging in any of the sequels. Uh, I, I like that, too. It's almost kind of a, a marketing tool right off the bat to kind of kick this costume into high gear. What does that red hat say? Boob Inspector? I was trying to figure out that, too. <laughs> So yeah, do you think David Arquette's pretty handsome in the original? <laughs> oh yeah, he pulls it off good. I think he's he's got that look that kind of He's got a baby face. He's got the baby face. Not the uh not the, the grizzled cop cop look. So if you were gonna be one character, what character from the original screen do you think you're most like? Billy. No, you know, that, not Billy. The bad boy, you know, do what I want. I would think maybe a combo of Dewey, Kenny, <laughs> and Randy. What? Like a combo of those three would make you. Like I'm probably a combo between Billy and then Steve from the beginning. <laughs> that would be like your complete opposite combo. In my love letter jacket <laughs> yeah you're more of a um i think you have those pajamas that tatum's wearing i don't but they're pretty cool i actually thought i actually thought at first they were buddies to match the buddy that she had <laughs> god i wonder if they still have these props like how much money this stuff would go for yeah Do you know much about the house? Sydney's house? Uh, no, I actually don't. Not Sydney's house, at least. I mean, right now, I mean, obviously, we're at Tatum's house. But, um, you know, I really, I don't know. I know a lot about the final house that they filmed in, which was the, the house where, you know, everything was just... You know, I forgot the exact scene number, but they actually made a t-shirt that said, I survived the scene because I think it was something like, something like 18 days was this one scene at this one house where, yeah, all of this stuff had to be filmed and it was just, it was torturous because it was just so emotionally exhausting. I mean, all of that stuff at Billy's house at the end is just, I mean, not Sue's house at the end. Uh, it's just it, it's grueling. <laughs> Dude, every time I watch this, now I think of uh, what was what was his name? In the scary, scary movie? movie, yeah, Doofy. Doofy, and when Doofy comes out with the not the um, vacuum cleaner, 
he was having a little fun with that. So there's a kind of a parody on on that scene. See, that's know. like you too. <laughs> The score is fun. It's kind of a little different, a little odd. And um, what are your kind of thoughts on the on the score, especially this the song that was just on? Uh, the score really works. I think that having the the same composer for the series really helps. You know, Scream is just one of those where I can hear kind of that that haunting music, and I know within a second that it's Scream. I don't even have to look at the the TV. It's just one of those classic scores and it's not as in your face as Halloween or Friday the 13th or even a Nightmare on Elm Street but it's still just as memorable mm -hmm. a little corn checks box cameo in the background there yeah I could eat that <laughs> it tastes like nothing the only thing corn checks are good for is making checks mix I like the chocolate um, checks that's really chocolate good chocolate checks you like puppy chow I love puppy chow <laughs> Whenever I make puppy chow, though, it's always, like, like I want to eat it right away so it doesn't completely cool. So it's, like, <laughs> all, like, it's your hands all chocolatey. Got a good outfit from Tatum here. She got the number 10 shortcut jersey on, I guess you could call don't it. Don't you own that outfit? <laughs> no, but I don't mind Tatum in it. I remember me and a friend of of mine we loved the scene so much we used to reenact the scene all the time which I, girl were you i think i was usually gail weathers yeah, i could see that <laughs> stop right there <laughs> so yeah this is kind of the days in the mid 90s where you'd see a lot of kind of harsh highlights that was really popular at the time. Um, you see that even more with Gail Weathers and Scream 2. Uh, I think that Courtney Cox looks really good in this one. I think she looks good in the sequel as well. Um, the third one, I don't know what was going on with her hair. We'll talk about that more when we watch Scream 3. So watching the original, uh, we this is our first time watching it together, even though we've both seen it many times. Um, is this still your favorite? It is, yeah. It's always going to have a kind of special special place in my heart. I'm always kind of a sucker for the originals. and um, Yeah, this is, this is one of them that I could, you know, pop in almost any day of the year and, and have a good time with it still after many, many years and, and viewings. Yeah, I think it holds up really well. Uh, I am one of the few people, I shouldn't even say few, because I know that there's there's kind of a growing minority out there that prefer Scream 2 to the original, but I, I got to admit, like, they're both just about perfect films for me. There's minor things that I don't like about the original, and there's very minor things that I don't like about the sequel. But they're pretty much, pretty much everything I think worked. There's much more about Scream 3 and Scream 4 that I think don't work. I think that the entire series is good. Um, you know, I we, we rate everything out of four Teddy Heads, which, you know, four, is, four is, the, is the best of the best. And I gave four to one and two. I gave three to part three, and I gave three and a half to four. Four. Uh, I, I'm going to have to watch these movies again to see how three and four kind of hold up for me. As of the last time I watched these, I think that I might marginally, very marginally, like parts part three to four. So what's your kind of official ranking on this series? Um, Pretty much goes with you. I mean, obviously, I, I love one and two. They almost kind of go, obviously, they, they do go hand in hand with each other. Um, Kind of like a, a nice back-to-back -back viewing. Um, then I'll go with four and then three. So, Kevin, what I was going to ask you earlier, um, after, you know, a mini-year hiatus, we had Scream 4 come out um, recently. What was the, I guess, attendance like, the crowd like when you saw it? When I went to it, it was it was a pretty hopping crowd. It was a good turnout. There were a couple people kind of dressed up and... It was kind of an exciting buzz. Yeah, I mean, 
we can talk about it a little, a little bit more when we watch Game 4, but uh, it was the only one of the series that I saw opening night at midnight. We had to drive an hour and a half to see it. We drove down to Madison. Um, so pretty big college town for that. And I knew right from that opening night at midnight, Scream 4 was going to have two problems. Problem number one was that the theater was only about half full, which for a fan-driven film, opening night at midnight is not good. It's not terrible, but if you can only fill it halfway at midnight and these just be hardcore fans, you know, what's that going to say for the rest of the weekend? And the other thing that I noticed, and I'll, I'll have to ask you the same thing, is that it seemed to bring out the older crowd, like the, especially I would say kind of the 25 to 35 year olds. Um, so more of the people that had grown up with the series, there were very, very few teens there and very few people that I would guess were under the age of 25. So I think that the, the fans that had grew up with the series were excited and pumped to watch Scream 4, but for whatever reason, the new audience, it it didn't carry on to them for whatever reason. No, same thing for me too. You can definitely tell that there were, there were people at Scream 4 who had probably seen all the other ones in the theaters. They were longtime fans. And um, that, that's kind of too bad because, I mean, with all these – you know, remakes coming out, you'd think maybe these the younger kids will want to go see something, even though obviously this wasn't a remake, but I mean, with, you know, all these sequels of Saw and Paranormal Activity coming out, and those would just be, you know, drawing in a lot of younger younger viewers. I was kind of hoping Scream could do that too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad, and I don't want to admit this, but I almost have to admit that had they released it as just Scream and sold it as a remake, mm -hmm. it probably would have done double the amount that it did. But I think that for too many people, especially younger fans, you know, this was the fourth movie of a series that they did not grow up with, and they just, they didn't have any reason to care because this wasn't part of their kind of experience into the horror genre. No, that makes a lot of sense. Do you see maybe 20 years from now or so that there could be a Scream re remake? Uh, well, they're working on the television show right now, which Wes Craven is in serious talks of directing the pilot, hmm. which it sounds like as of the last time that I heard that he is going to do it. You know, anything can change. So these two girls, these two kind of bitchy girls in the, like in the mirror, um, would you say that you'd be the one with the mob khakis? <laughs> look how <laughs> terrible that looks. I just love that when I mean, she's that... like, you are pathetic. <laughs> like the contrast between those two outfits is ridiculous. Which one do you think's hotter, the, <laughs> the mob khakis or the cheerleader? The cheerleader. The cheerleader down. was actually dating Skeet at the time. Mm. I don't know if he got her the role, but yeah, the, the blonde cheerleader was Skeet Ulrich's girlfriend at the time. Who, who do you think Dana is? I saw that little graffiti in the wall that says Dana's fast. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't know what they mean by that. <coughs> so I've always wondered, this is something that they never really come out and say, and, well, they kind of say that what it what appears to be a prank, is this really ghost face in the bathroom, or is this just somebody dressed up playing a prank? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um... I kind of feel like it's supposed to be the real ghost face. Um, I don't know if it comes across like that or if they pull it off well enough. What do you think? I think it works as either. I guess uh, I always like to believe that it's the real one. I think that if you believe that it's fake, I don't think the scene works as well. Nope. And I mean, it's got the same boots too. I mean, there's just too much of a coincidence. Although... Lots of people did have Doc Martens at this time. Mm. I know I had a pair. Mm. Uh, they were very stylish. Very, They were good shoes. So, you know, maybe maybe there was a lot. But uh, we're getting up to the point pretty soon. I hate that blouse that she's wearing. It's so <laughs> ugly. Um, but, oh, so this here, um, 
I believe I'm gonna fuck up her name. I think her name's Lisa Beach, but she's actually the the she did casting for the entire series. Hmm. So uh, she's got a little cameo in this. Uh, very believable as a news lady. I'd buy her. She's kind of got that look. Definitely. Um, but so after this scene with Courtney and David, we're gonna see these little glimpses, and it's what it's the only thing that I don't like about the original screen. If I could go back, I would cut them out myself. And I don't know. I haven't talked to you much about this, Steve, but there's like there's a part when they're in the supermarket and yep, you see like the the, same thing. the, the <laughs> shadow of of Ghostface in in the mirror in the window, and then like there's a scene also where he's like running through the bushes. Like I don't get that. I don't think it works. I think it's really cheesy. It's honestly the only thing I don't like about this movie. And every time I watch it. When I see that, I just kind of cringe a little because I just, I don't think it works. I don't even think when I was a teen that I really cared for it that much. So how do you feel? I feel the same. I don't, I don't understand it. I, I think cheesy is a good word for it. Has Wes said anything about it? Whether that was no, like I don't think they mentioned it. Well, I know at the end, at the end of screen two, when they do the, the, the pan up, uh, the ghost face guy is supposed to be in the bell tower at the very end. And they cut that out last minute. I'm like, oh, thank God. That would have been awful. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know if that would have been a nod to kind of these in touches in the original. But I would not have liked that at all. So this uh, jacket, this red jacket that uh, she's wearing in this scene, uh, a little joke or a little... Yeah, I guess kind of an in-joke is later on, uh, two years later, or was it? No, it was two years later in Romeo Michelle's High School Reunion. Lisa yeah. Kudrow from Friends wears that same jacket in one of the scenes. Oh, that's cool. I never knew that. Moving camera shots they do in this film. I think mm -hmm. it adds a lot. Yeah, there is a lot of movement to this. One thing that, I mean, when this movie came out, this movie had a budget of $14 million, which wasn't a lot for... You know, 1996 standards, it's definitely not a lot for today's standards. But for a horror movie in 96, 14 million, that was a decent amount of money. I mean, I think that uh, for for inflation, it would probably be equal to about 25 million today, which is probably more than a horror movie like this would get for a budget. I think that if a slasher was starting out today, in all honesty, it would probably get a very limited release. It would probably be a kind of a video on demand, uh, select theaters thing, kind of like Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Uh, you know, I can't even remember. I guess Your Next was kind of the last slasher that got a wide release. And even that, I mean, I think it did a total of around $18 million in the U.S., so... It was definitely not a big hit, uh, not a huge financial success for the studio, which was Lionsgate, which is actually kind of um, a little bit ironic because uh, Lionsgate actually bought the rights to release the original three screen movies on Blu-ray. Unfortunately, the, the home video rights to four belong to Anchor Bay, so I don't know if we're ever going to get a full... Uh, series box set i know that they do over uh overseas in some countries because uh just just the the rights are different for the series and for the sequels but you know who knows i i would still like to see those i think these could i think these look good on blu-ray i think that they could use kind of a uh, a polish up uh kind of a uh, a fresh coat of paint and it, it would be interesting too to have like a brand new commentary with the the crew because the, the commentary that's on here now is just, for the original at least, Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven. And I think it was recorded for the Laserdisc back in like 97 wow. or 98. <laughs> so long, long time ago. In high school, did your principal have a closet with clothes? I don't know. I was <laughs> never in the principal's office. My principal was a female, though. She mm, might have. I did yours? I wouldn't assume so. Did you have to go to the principal's office a lot? Uh, no. Did you ever talk to the principal? No. Like, I remember talking to the vice principal our once. Our school is so big, though. I mean, our school is pretty big, too. I mean, our graduating class was something like 350. 
which you know is a, a decent size for a graduating class. Um, I think that there was something like I don't know, maybe fourteen hundred kids that went to my school. Nice. Um, something, something like that. So I mean, it, ours definitely wasn't a small school, but um, it it, w- it was just big enough where I knew most of the people that were in my class. Uh, not much for any of the other classes, unless I had I happened to to share uh subjects with them. But yeah, so here we get kind of the the scene outside. So I mean, speaking of school, uh, did your school do? periods hours what was your school like for that like what were they called oh boy hard to even think back that far hours i think and then we yeah had... ours was hours like it'd be like second hour third hour fourth hour and then we had we had it broken down into trimesters so we had three obviously trimesters and then now i guess they went back to the quarters now or semesters i think so yeah we had we had quarters but um well i mean the the school is broke down in quarters but what you'd have is that for for a lot of classes like for health it would only be a semester long so you'd have it for like half the year and then the other half of the year you'd have gym instead so the you know there were some classes like english where you'd have it all year round <laughs> but i'm just laughing at Stu knocking all the did you ever work at a video <laughs> store VHS tapes. Uh, no, I He's didn't. handling those way too easily. You know there's nothing in those. <laughs> those are heavy. Uh, I worked at Hollywood Video for a few years, and Hollywood Video was bought out by Movie Gallery, and then I moved to Appleton, and then I ended up working at Family Video. Uh, so I would say, like, I probably worked at a video store for probably a third of my life. I would say a good a good 10 years of my life was spent working at a video store, and at least 10 years before that was spent looking around at a video store. And I loved working at a video store. I loved movies. I loved the chance of getting to watch them ahead of time. I loved recommending movies to people. And sometimes you would recommend some good movies and sometimes the people wouldn't like them. And other times, you would just get so frustrated by how stupid people were, especially like, like I mean, people today are not going to know this, but this VHS era, uh, God, that was when I worked at Hollywood Video. That was one of the first jobs I ever had when I was like 18. And people did not like to rewind their movies, which when it was like one or two, it was fine. But when you were waiting, like, and you had like nine rewinders, like, and there was like a stack of like 50 movies that needed to be rewound before they went on the shelf. It was so obnoxious and so annoying. I just got so mad. And I, I would put like notes on people's accounts. It's like, remember to rewind or like just stuff like that. Hmm. Which is funny too. It just like this scene, because we got Matthew Lillard in it. And just two years before this, he did Serial Mom, which he also worked at a video store in that movie. And he liked to watch horror movies, which I think is kind of a, a nice little twist. Especially the fact that he's one of the killers in this one. Mm-hmm. So, of the three guys, you kind of have a a preference of who you like the best. I mean, I sometimes I feel like I would, I should be annoyed at Matthew Lillard a little more than I am, but I I, I like him. I like Stu in this. I really do. I'm more annoyed by Randy. Honestly, there's something there's something just grating about him. I think that. Um, Skeet Ulrich is definitely the sexiest. He probably has more sex appeal than anyone in this film, male or female. There's just something about him that just oozes sex appeal. And, you know, I think that he just became this character that uh, girls wanted to date and guys wanted to be. So I don't know about this. That um, So she was attacked. I guess the principal was killed. They haven't, they haven't found out yet that the principal was killed. So just right now... There's just the two at the beginning. I don't know if there would be this whole town curfew where they're all closing down. And they mentioned that it's closing down at nine. And like, if it's a school year, this still seems re- This looks very early. Like this seems like like school like just got out. Like I do not believe this is late at night. So no, I not at all. And um, so w- Woodsboro. Maybe I'm just being ignorant or stupid, but um. Do you know anything behind the the name of Woodsboro? Where that comes from? Who came up with it? Why? 
Um, I feel like I should, but I honestly don't know where the fans. Okay. So does Neb Campbell remind you of a young Meg Ryan? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> you see more of Tori Spelling? <laughs> Good old Tori Spelling. I've always liked that skirt that Tatum's wearing. It's got the, the twist going right in the crotch region. Okay, so I was actually talking with um, our friend Andrew about this Blu-ray, and I don't know if you remember this, or because um, you didn't see it in theaters, and I don't remember exactly what the VHS transfer was like, but I feel like the colors of this Blu-ray are very muted. I remember, for whatever reason, I remember that skirt being a lot brighter. And when she's got on, like, the, the green, I remember it almost being, like, a neon or almost, like, a fluorescent. And here it's almost more like a line. So I don't know if it's something that has to do with the transfer, if the colors are a little bit washed out. Uh, but it, it, would be, it would be interesting to kind of look back and see, see what that is. Looks like he's got a strawberry cone. <laughs> That's good. You can always go for some good ice cream. I don't like fake strawberry ice cream. I really, I actually hate it. Um, like ones with the little bits in there? No, I really hate that. That's good it's stuff. Like, it's, Those are real strawberries. You just said you don't like no, fake, it's like, but you don't like actual strawberries in your ice well, cream. Well, it's like frozen strawberry <laughs> chunks, and it's mm. in like, there's something about that fake strawberry like that it's it reminds me of like those strawberry shakes from like mcdonald's those are good no i hate that like delicious i want like the strawberry seeds and i want like chunks of strawberry in my ice cream i just said that no not when it's like frozen like what is else is it going to be if it's in ice cream <laughs> it doesn't taste the same <laughs> when it's in fake strawberry ice cream and i always hate this that he just throws <laughs> on his cone that's a waste Here we got one of my favorite songs from the soundtrack, Youth of America. The stuff at night looks really good. Have you, would you throw I they the, did a great um, job. Hey, are you a litter bug like that? No. Why would you throw it outside? I'm sure that van's littered with crap if you can get there. Maybe me, Courtney Cox yelled at him. <laughs> So this this seems weird that like if my brother was a cop, I can't imagine having the relationship with him that he would drive me to a party where he, there's gonna be underage drinking. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. I don't really know what to think because I mean you kind of get the idea. Well, that do you think that that she that he bought them alcohol? I don't think. Well, I guess did. like they it looks like they only brought like chips and stuff. They just so. brought the chips and stuff. It's weird because he he comes across like he's he's trying to be you know a bigger better cop than he really is and he's trying to set this kind of example so it's it is kind of weird that he would bring them to a party. So what movie do you think Corny looks the best? We talked about Nav. Corny looks good in this one. What about in the second one with the uh, red streaks? <laughs> <coughs> she's good there too. She's she's got the. So you just like you think everyone look. looks the best in the original. What about Dewey? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Like, I have to. I have to go back and check out. He's, some, he's some a little. Toys. Well, they originally wanted him to audition for the role of um, Billy. Billy? Yeah, oh, I can't see that at all. Uh, but he he really liked this character, and he wanted a chance to kind of show his comedic side. So you can't see him as Billy. Can you see him as Stu? No, he's too. I don't know. Well, he, he plays a really good kind of nervous, nervous character, which I think works good for this cop. And um, I don't know. Gosh, I don't know. It's just it's always weird to put somebody else in in a character. These are not I just these are not the movies that I'd recommend to be watching, especially like they have Hellraiser. That's not a party movie. <laughs> Is that that girl in the blue dress? She's looking good. She's looking. She's all dolled up. Uh, 
<laughs> so, I don't know, like, so, like, was there, like, a famous TV anchor woman that was, like, for Nina or that area? Okay. Well, the, like, the uh, news came from Green Bay. Okay, so if it was Green Bay, like... Tammy Elliott. So if you guys were having a party as teens and Tammy Elliott showed up at the party. The guys would be all over her. Like, but like, mm, I don't know if it's, if it's just me, but like, I'd be like paranoid. It's like, oh my God, like she's going to do a news piece on us drinking. Like, you know what I mean though? Like, I, I guess maybe that's more of the culture today with everything being, you know, kind of the, the streaming video uh -huh. immediately. Yeah, everything's just out there right away. But I think that today that there would be more of a panic of the, you know, why is she here than the, oh my God, yeah, invite this woman who might do a news story on us underage drinking when we should be at a lockdown curfew. Like, think, well, <laughs> the guys want her in there. But everyone's saying, like, the girls <laughs> didn't have any problem with it either. We have a fun scene as well. I mean, we get kind of the. So the do you UV remember that skirt being a lot there. brighter, or that I shirt too? I don't know too. if I was paying attention to the colors at this point. Like that shirt, though. Like I, I felt like it was always a brighter. Like this, I don't know. Is there's something about this? This feels very washed out to me. Hmm. You don't see that. <laughs> What about the naps? I see those. That's a lot of beers to carry. It is. She's doing good. That would it's be not her first time. That would be cold. Like <laughs> she, like you could tell those beers are warm because, <laughs> especially having it right there on your arm. Yeah, that'd be freezing. And if you're gonna be having a party, I think you'd probably bring all the beers in the. They in ran the, out. The kitchen fridge. They were. You gotta stock that up. You they probably drank them all. You like the glitter on I think it works. I think it makes the I think it makes the outfit pop. I so would you be scared or would you just think this is just a prank? I don't know. At this point I might be a little freaked out. But I do like <laughs> the way that they kind of have a little playful back and forth for a little bit at least. So what would you do if you were her? He's what's a, he cuts your arm. Ow! At least she fights back. I mean, she grabs the beer, she throws it at off. Mm -hmm. You know, she does what she can. But yeah, I I totally agree with you. I think that he's one of the the clumsiest killers. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do like a. I like a scene where the the girl, guy, whoever they they fight back, do what they can to kind of save themselves. Um, in the end, doesn't work out the best for our lovely Tatum, but so it's always crazy because like I always like, I you know I've seen this movie well over a hundred times, and I always think that. Tatum dies later than what she does. Like, I always forget how much of the movie is left after her death. Mm -hmm. Like, we still have a lot of stuff going on. So this is this is one of the things that they had to cut. They had to cut a couple of frames from her um, getting crushed. But it was fine because it already kind of looks a little bit fakey. And you just see, like, more of the crushed plastic head. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually fine with that cut. Like Stu's robe? No, that's dumb. That's cool. He's like the king yeah. of the party. With his got the long chain necklace. Yeah. Now, Billy is cool. Look hmm. at that hair. <laughs> so did it... Do you think that Scream... Did Scream make you more smart or more savvy about what you would do if you were in a horror movie? I think it does. I think it does. I think a lot of people probably never maybe quite thought about it. And then after watching this, then, then they did. Yeah. 
yourself? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, this kind of, like I said before, this movie really defined a generation, really changed how an, an entire audience felt about horror movies. <coughs> There's your character sitting in the van eating chips. No, I think I'd be more you. I would be Courtney Cox. Yeah. So out of all of our friends, who do you think would be most like Courtney Cox? Zachary Allen? <laughs> yeah, Zachary Allen can play... Uh, he actually just sent me a message and he said, because he knew that we were doing the, the commentary tonight, and he said, how many shout outs did I get? <laughs> and so I think right now, including that one, Zachary, you're up to four. So. Pretty good right <laughs> Um, our good Slash Studios friend, colleague, Maddie Dorsher, you'd probably be our, our Billy, I'm thinking. Probably the closest, yeah. I mean, because we, we did our own kind of Scream movie, which was Popularity Killer, which he definitely played the, the Billy-esque character. Um, why can't I remember his name of that? Corey. Corey, yes, that's right. You have somebody who you'd like to take on uh, the role of Sydney? If, like, for the people that we've worked with? Correct. Um, that's a good question. I honestly don't know. I think I would have to go with our uh, our main girl from Teddy, and uh, that would be Nikita. She's yeah, a fantastic actress, so she could be Yeah, she's anything. great. I could definitely see that. So, yeah, um... Kevin, would you fall in? Would you fall into the trap of Billy's charm? Yeah, who wouldn't? <laughs> Look at that, just smoldering sex appeal. I mean, there's not a girl or a guy that's going to turn that down. <laughs> I'm sure if you were sitting on the bed right there, you know, 1996, that might have been the one that you would have lost your virginity to. Oh, it would have been me and Tatum. I would have saved her life because we would have been up in the no, room. No, you would be kissing Skeelorge's <laughs> finger because you just look at those eyes and that hair and there's just nothing you can say but yes, please, let's do it. And he's got the flannel. Plaid. Same difference. You always get that wrong. It's the same thing. <laughs> that's still, that's a nice shirt. He could get away with wearing that today easily. Kevin, I know there were a couple variations of the, the VHS that came out, correct? Yeah, there was the original release, which had the whole cast on it, and then there was the special release, which actually the special release is popular for a number of reasons. It had a Scream making of documentary at the very end of it. It also started with a preview of Scream 2, and it also, for whatever reason, it leaked, and that's the only way... In the United States, I believe the Laserdisc is the unrated cut, and those VHS are the unrated hmm. cut. But there's three special ones. They're blue editions, and one has Nev on the cover, one has Courtney on the cover, and one has Drew on the cover. I have the Drew one, and I have the Courtney one, but I still need the Nev one. And I remember they had them for sale. They had a big standy. It was right around Christmas, right around the time that Scream 2 came out. And I, and I already had Scream, but I had to get this one again. And I picked up the, the Courtney one. And um, my good friend that was with me, uh, he picked up the Nev one. No. I'm trying to remember. No, I think he actually got the Drew one. There's your girl. I always love the... She's kind of got Darlene hair. Darlene hair, that's good. I always love the frame that they, they pause this on. I think it's very... Very witty, very smart. Kind of a little, a little wink and nod to, to the audience there. Stu's not acting like a gentleman if he's <laughs> got a girlfriend. 
Why would he be over her if he's dating Stu Tatum? and Stu. I guess Tatum's dead by this point. Yeah. He knows that she's dead, but... That's true. He's moved on. How do you like this line coming up from Stu? That I'll be right back? Yeah. I don't know. Stu kind of gets <laughs> on my nerves in this. I think that... I mean, he's fine. He is what he is. Um, I really believe that a little of his character goes a long way. Um, so I'm just looking at Randy's t-shirt. It says Fresh Jive. What is that? Is that a band? Is that a brand? Is that... I have no idea. Fresh Jive. If anybody knows that, let us know. So, um, one thing about Kevin Williams' script that has actually started a bidding war in Hollywood, um, it was between Dimension and Oliver Stone's production company, and he really wanted to make this too... That would have been a completely different film. I think it would have been much more heavy on the violence, much more heavy, I think, on the satire, and it definitely wouldn't have been as kind of wink-wink as this movie is. So if there is one aspect of Scream that you think kind of put it over the top, what would that be? Or could you not even pinpoint it to one aspect? Was it just the whole mesh of everything coming together. I think it was just the right movie at the right place at the right time. It was just, it was movie magic. Hmm. Okay, so you said you knew a little bit about this house. What What do you know? Where, where is this? Um, I know house this house. It? I don't know if it's still um, California. I believe Northern California. Um as of not too long ago, Stu's house is for sale. It was like two point one million, I believe. Um, I oh. don't know if somebody ended up buying it, but yeah, it was an actual house. They kind of were selling it based on the house that that's where Scream was filmed. So um, yeah, that was. I'm trying to remember. I I remember I was like looking at houses when we were kind of location scouting for Don't Go the Reunion. So it was probably about this time last year, and it was on the market, so I'm sure it's probably sold by now. But uh, hopefully some lucky fan of the Scream movies who's got a lot, a lot of money now mm. owns his house. I would love to do a tour of it. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Trying to check that out and uh, see, all the, see all the rooms that we've we've grown to know throughout the years by watching this film. So are there any of these characters that are here that aren't really talking or don't get much <laughs> screen time that you'd like to know more of? Um, they all seem... The guy with the hat? They all seem kind of the same, really. This was like the Nina <laughs> parties, right? Oh, yeah. The old Doritos bag. We got a Clerks cameo in there yep, as well. Yeah, we also have the Clerks poster at the, at the, um, at the video store. Do you like Tostitos? <laughs> How could you just eat those plain? That's the worst. Hopefully he's got some salsa down there. I don't see any. <laughs> I just see that in his can of Coke. Who eats plain Tostitos? Yeah, hopefully some salsa or some queso. Queso on. I could go for some queso right now. Yeah. I guess you got the hankering for a little bit of beer dip right now. Beer dip does sound good. I actually made some taco dip the other day. Mm. It was really good. I made some cheese quesadillas and I was dipping it in the, the taco dip and it was amazing. It's it was always good. It was everything that I ever thought it could be. Add some Frank's Red Hot to it. Do you like the the relationship between between Gail and Dewey? Yeah, I think it's really sweet and I think it's very believable. I kind of like her ruthless ambition, you know, kind of versus his kind of innocence and his kind of um, he's very gullible as a character, so it's kind of nice to see that that contrast. And it was great to see the fact that, you know, kind of seeing their relationship grow in this series and to also see it grow in real life. Unfortunately, they are no longer together, which, you know, I can't even imagine what it was like screen, filming Scream 4 with them having separated. But, I mean, I, I know that is kind of one of the, the themes of Scream 4 is that, you know, they kind of feel like their marriage is falling apart, but... That would have been interesting to say the least. I think they actually still get along as far as what I've 
I mean, hope so, but I have, I think they have children. I think he cheated on her. Oh, I didn't I didn't know that. But. I I'm pretty sure that he did. Or I maybe it was just a rumor, or he had said that they were already separated by the time that this girl said that. But she was considerably younger. Who was it? Laurie Metcalf? No, no, it was actually <laughs> when they were filming Scream Four, I believe. That like that he was like partying with like the teenage extras, and that was one of the girls that he really? slept with. As I, th- I think it's just a rumor. I think that like I remember them talking about it on Howard Stern. Howard Stern's always good though. Yeah, I love Howard Stern. <laughs> Howard Stern's always a good time. And it's been a while since I've kind of caught up my Howard Stern, but what was the last one that I had you the crazy pet lady? I don't know. I can't remember. They all just kind of blend into one for me. Uh, I love Howard Stern, especially when he does like the the pranks and like celebrities and stuff, or <laughs> like the undercover like interviews. Um, he's kind of an asshole, but at the same time, he'll he'll ask questions that we're kind of all wondering about. So yeah, uh, David Arquette was on there. I believe he was promoting Scream Four, and he was of course asking a bunch of questions about Courtney, a bunch of questions about you know. I believe that David was the only one of like the original actors that kind of stayed on set and kind of hung out with like the younger group. Hmm. I think that, uh, well, now Nat- younger girls, <laughs> yeah, probably younger <laughs> girls. But uh, I know that Courtney has said that uh, Scream Four was kind of the the first one of the series where her and Nev got a chance to bond because it's it's crazy that. Like when you when you're this age when you're much when you were much younger that you know when there's like five or six years, uh, that seems like a huge gap and you don't feel like there's a lot of you know similarities. And once you get older, I mean, they're both you know I believe they're both in their forties now. You know, when you see it then and it's five six years, you know mm-hmm. that that's nothing. So I think that they you know really had a lot to ca- a lot of common stuff to talk about you know they've both been pretty busy uh nav you know she's had an interesting career she uh both scream and scream 2 and actually scream 3 they were all big box office successes she had uh, a big hit with the craft a fairly decent sized hit with uh wild things um you know she could have pretty much did anything and she kind of decided to stay out of the limelight and kind of do more indie type roles. And I think she's honestly fine with that. You know, I don't think that, you know, celebrity, there was ever, you know, anything about that that really that much appealed to her. Mm-hmm. And that, that's that's what's kind of re- refreshing about her in a, in a unique way, which is kind of cool. I mean, you got the big, big kind of superstar, especially back in the day with Courtney Cox. And then, you know, Nev, who, like you said, just kind of stayed out of the, the limelight and, um, you know, is... Well, and this movie, Scream, really started a trend with horror, something that still continues to this date, and that's having your horror movie filled with television stars. And, you know, this movie at the time, um, Nev Campbell was working on Party of Five, and you had Courtney Cox, who's, who, she was on the number one rated show on television at the time, Friends, which to have her do kind of this low-budget slasher, I mean, that was unheard of. I mean, nowadays it would be much more common, but in in the mid-90s, I mean, you know, I bet there was probably her agent was saying, you know, why do you want to do this little horror film? Mm-hmm. I think Scream is the only series to keep the entire original cast throughout. Um, That's really cool. I guess you could kind of say Paranormal Activity um, in just like minor roles, but I mean, they have huge roles in each of them and they actually grow through each of the Scream films. And I don't feel like you really have that with any of the other um, horror franchises. Mm -hmm. So we saw Billy just kind of get all bloodied up fall in the bed so your first time watching this kevin what was going through your mind at this point i don't even know i remember the scene when they're um when it's Stu and randy and they're both trying to get in the house and she's got to decide which one she wants to believe i remember being like in the theater being like what what i don't know what i would do <laughs> i'd probably lock them both out i 
I, I really like the 30 second uh, delay. Yeah, the, I was just gonna say the the delay. I think that was that was a cool touch. The whole, oh, the whole he just died. That, that he was able to watch this and then not be able to help out. So she's resourceful. She's smart. She's doing the best she can. Um, I don't know what I would do in this situation. I mean, we all think that we know if we were in a horror movie exactly what we would do. I I don't know if that's necessarily <laughs> the case. Um, I think that I would probably end up dead. You'd probably be like quivering in the corner, and then he just he just got you from there. Well, I I always had a dream when I was a kid that if there was ever if there was ever like a uh, a killer after me that I would just hide under my bed until the end credits came. Hmm, there you go. And I would like peek out and then I could see the end credits and then hmm. I knew that the killer was. So I, I never fought the killer in my dreams. Hmm. I would just wait for the end credits. So which of like the baddies, like the, the horror villains that you have the most nightmares about? Chucky? No. Well, A, I never ever remember any of my dreams. You don't remember having any nightmares about any of the... There is a dream back in the day, and it's... A wet dream back in the day, it you say? It wasn't a wet dream, no. But um, I do have a dream of some person kind of chasing me around a barn, and there are just thorns everywhere, and it resembles Freddy Krueger. <coughs> so I don't know if it was actually him that was chasing me or not in my dream. No, oh, it's scary, terrifying. Sounds now, like th there, sexy. there's a lot of people who do not like lens flares, but there's a number of lens flares in this film. Oh, I love them. I, I think, think they that add a little for, for the right for the right movie. They work. Um, for a stylish horror movie, I I love them. Um, I know that one recent one that uses a lot of lens flares would be the the Silent Night remake, which is just. Pretty much there's not a scene in that movie that doesn't have lens flares. And I mean, the entire last act is pretty much nothing but them. But hey, if you can make it work with your style, um, I say go for it. Hmm. It's that, that huge phone. Brick phone hit Randy on the forehead. I remember seeing this scene uh, when I watched the review on Siskel and Eva right before I saw the movie. And I'd be like, oh, what, what happened there? Like, what's going on? Like, it stopped right as the body fell down. It's like, I was like, who's, who's that? Like, I was just like trying to piece it all together. And for those of you guys who haven't watched it, I believe that the Siskel Neighbor review for Scream and Scream 2 are both online. Siskel did not like the original that much. He thought it was too violent. And it there wasn't enough of the, the smart comedic moments for it to work for him. Uh, Ebert liked the original a lot, and Siskel came around on the sequel and thought the sequel was much better and much more original. And yeah, they it was it was the only one of the four of them that they ended up giving um, two thumbs up to was Scream Two. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, they they always have some some good funny reviews on there. So if you can check those out, be sure to do so. Yeah, we actually, it's funny that um, we just did last week the the review for the people under the stairs, and literally the the same day or like the day after, or possibly even the day before, right around the time that we did our commentary, um, somebody had posted the the old Cisco Neighbor review for people under the stairs, which I hadn't seen in years, and it was funny because, um, yeah, Cisco really liked the movie a lot, and Ebert said he liked the look of the movie, but he thought the story was silly, and he called it Funeral Home Alone. <laughs> Which, that, that's a great title. That is a good title. I like that. He, he, he's a trademark that. So do you think they like seeing the F word a lot in this? Hmm. Well, maybe more than any other movie this genre, caliber. I think being trapped inside a vehicle would be one of the more scary places to be trapped. Because, I mean, 
you you lock on the door and you grab know, something. You don't know where the person's gonna pop up. I mean, they could be on top. They could be underneath. I think you I would the glass lay, lay down on the back on the seat and then just have something in my hand. That's what I would do. What would you have in your hand? I would grab whatever weapon was in there. <laughs> Like, if I was in your car, probably, like, an old Taco Bell bag. <laughs> or maybe squirt, like, ketchup in their eye. <laughs> I'm sure that's in your car. I don't have any ketchup. Maybe napkins? Blind them? Um, Wet wipes? Ice, ice scraper. There you go. <laughs> maybe oil? <laughs> So who would you believe, or would you just close the door on both of them? I just close the door. And she knows what's she knows what to do. Save yourself. She got some good uh, good blood gore makeup on right now <coughs> on her face. Looks pretty good. So what I always loved was, and I don't know if it's directly intentional, but uh, one of my favorite Friday Thirteen sequels, Friday Thirteen Part Seven. Um, right as she opens the door instead of closing it, Melissa says, no, fuck you both. Um, so I don't know if that was an in reference or if it just happened to be, but, um, yeah, the door and everything looks really similar. So I don't, I don't know if that was an in joke to that movie, but that's something that I, I caught right from the very first time that I saw this. Hmm. Yes, Billy's got some really creepy looks. Do you think he looks sexier before? And how about Randy's shoes? He's got some pretty crazy shoes. He had some green, I think bright green suede ones on earlier, I believe. And now he's got some red ones on. Yeah, I mean. He's very, they, very hipster. They almost look <laughs> like Chucks, but they're not. They don't look like Chucks at all. Yeah, they kind of do. <laughs> Uh-oh, so now stuff is... So did you predict this twist, that there was two killers the first time you saw it? No, but I, I love it. I love it. So I remember in the original script that they couldn't decide whether or not there should be a motive or not. And the ultimate compromise was that one of them would have a motive and one of them wouldn't. So that they'd be able to satisfy both horror fans, the ones that want an explanation and the ones that think it's scarier when there's no explanation mm. at all. So, did you, do you do you feel like Billy and Sue are close? I think they're close. Like, how close do you think their relationship is? Like, really? I think Stu wants to be closer than Billy. Do you think I think Billy's stringing Stu along. That's what I think. Do you believe that with her, that that was Billy's first time, or do you think Billy has had sex with Stu? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think Billy's had his fair fair share of the <coughs> the pretty ladies of Woodsboro. So, and uh, perhaps Stu is not one of the pretty ladies. Stu is not one of the pretty ladies. Stu wishes he was one of the pretty <coughs> ladies, and uh, Billy picked up on this. He knew he needed Stu. I mean, there's a whole subtext that you could go into, too, that, like, that that was the reason that Drew's character broke up with him when that was that he was secretly gay <laughs> and that she threatened to reveal to people that he was gay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would not be surprised if they did a remake, if they really touched on that more. I feel like there would have to be more of a connection to that opening murder I feel like right now it's very loose, um, but it's definitely a possibility. Throwing mm -hmm. it out there. I know that um, Randy does mention in the sequel that Billy was very homo repressed. <laughs> So 
So I guess the uh, the acting between Billy and Stu, how do you how do you like that? Because I mean, Stu is very alive oh. and almost kind of theatrical. I like how Billy um, Skeet Ulrich plays it better, but it just has to do with the fact that I like the character of Billy better. I think that they both work for their characters. But like I said before, for me at least, a little bit of Stu goes a long, long way. Sure. And then well, what do you think about the dad coming out? I don't know how long he was in there. <laughs> how long was he in the closet? That's a long time to be in the closet. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't know about that. Was he in there for days? I guess. I just, I, I've never been a big fan of that. Well, they had to frame him and say he was the one who killed everybody. Yeah. Where else are they going to have him? So, what would you have done if you were, say, Billy or Stu to become successful in their scheme? I think the the biggest thing that you should learn by this is that you should probably work alone. <laughs> um, I think that's the thing that um, we've learned from Scream, Scream 2, and Scream 4 is that one of the partners is going to end up fucking the other partner over, especially Scream 2 and 4, which I don't know if it's it's something about um, ruthless females in this, but in both, in both instances where we've had a female killer, the female killers ended up killing the other killer who's been male. So I think that, that that's really interesting, and I'm sure there's an entire social, you know, commentary right there that could be played on that. Hmm. Do you like the drooling from Stu? It's it's good. It's some good drooling, a little spit flowing. Um, but no, I I. I don't really mind like he he is a little bit kind of crazy right now and he could he could get obnoxious but for whatever reason like i said before i don't really mind it i think it kind of plays plays with a nice contrast to, to billy's to billy's acting so yeah this was another scene that the mpa really hated there was a lot more of the blood dripping on the floor and a lot more of the stabbing between the two of them uh yeah the mpa was not a fan of that at all so I know I'm getting cut down a lot. I remember being really happy the first time I saw this in the theater, finding out that Courtney Cox's character was not dead. <laughs> so how many times would you say you've seen this? Mm. So I want to know, well, before you answer that, is that if she was standing there that whole entire time, would he have seen her? Like I think, I think we're kind she of just rolls in. I think we're Through kind of shadows. cheating with the <laughs> the camera angles a little bit because we don't see her move at all. I don't all. think she was right in the doorway the whole time. But she would have had to have grabbed it. Grabbed what? <laughs> so you think she was right around the corner that whole time, and then she just jumped out? Yes. Mm, no, I think that we're playing. Uh, they fell on each other at least. Yeah, I don't know about that. What's what's? Your, I don't think she just jumped out. I told you that they were just cheating with camera angles. <laughs> no, in the actual. <laughs> I think he would have seen her. I don't think that they used an excuse for it. I think they are just... I mean, that's a very... It's a very common horror movie trope of using the... We would see... If the person was actually there, we would see it, but because the camera's there, we don't. Um, I think that that's something that horror movies have always cheated on, especially the slasher genre.
we have Sydney kind of turning the tables right now. Um, I like how they, they have her make the phone call. So uh, you didn't get a chance to answer the question. How many times have you oh, seen this? Um, gosh, I don't know. I, it's not as many as you have, but a few couple times a year for sure. Since, I don't know, way back in the day. It's, it's always been one of my faves. Yeah, I always say the first year that this came out, I probably rented it. I don't know, maybe eight, nine times in the video store. I probably spent a good $40 probably just on renting this. <laughs> I always like when he throws the phone at him. I don't know it why. It supposed to hit him. <laughs> oh, and Sue just goes berserk, ripping out the pillows. Yeah, that... Oh, that poor house. <coughs> yeah, with with films like this, I guess scenes like this, when they have such a kind of a high end location like this, I always wonder what was actually there when they came in to start filming, what they brought in, mm -hmm. what they had to fix and pay for. Well, one thing that's really interesting too is that this was Wes's first movie that he had done in the anamorphic widescreen which is the the 2.35 oh. which is the the big black bars which he does he does a really good job working with the cinematographer of really taking advantage of every single inch that we see on screen mm -hmm. yeah and you, you can tell that a lot i mean there's a like the party scenes when they're we're in the um the living room and there's all those all those kids gathered around, and you kind of get all them in into there on one shot. Yeah, this was a movie that definitely did not work as well um, watching it full frame on VHS. Oh, that's gonna be terrible. I can't even imagine watching it now. Yeah. I bet it would probably just give me a headache. I mean, back in the VHS kind of uh, movement, you know, you just kind of you just accepted you just it that it, yeah. that's what it was because that was your only option. So our friend um, from France, Lucas, he did a little uh, short film called Babysitting, which he did on homage to this death right here. Mm -hmm. It was kind of fun. So one thing that is interesting about Scream is that it's very... Horror fans are very divided on this. I know of a lot of horror fans that absolutely love it. There's another uh, very vocal minority that hates this franchise and hates what it did to the genre and just the fact that it made it bigger budget and then it made it um, prettier, for lack of a better word. And just all of a sudden after this movie, you know, you had the... The posters everywhere of like the floating heads and you had to get names for your horror movies and um i i don't blame that on screen i understand why people don't like that that's kind of what horror became but i think that you kind of have to judge this movie based on its own merits and this movie was phenomenal both for its time and judging it today yeah i mean i, I can see where where both sides are but you know, more along the lines of what you're saying too. I mean, it's it was a well done film. I mean, it looks it looks great, and um, I mean you have a good a good cast, a good score, and good direction and cinematography, and you just kind of put that all together. You're gonna have you're gonna have something something good and something that people are gonna want to watch. And I guess what it may or may not have created, I don't necessarily think that's what they they set out to do. Yeah. Dad. <laughs> dad. Silly dad. That'd probably be you. It's hiding <laughs> over the closet. <laughs> He's useless. So, one thing that I guess we can talk about more when we talk about the Scream 4 commentary was that I remember hearing in all of the press releases and everything that Sydney comes back in Scream 4 because her dad dies. And that's kind of what brought her back. But whatever happened, that must have been completely cut from the movie. I don't even think the dad's mentioned at all. Um, so, yeah, it's it would be interesting to see what happened there. I mean, in 4 now, she's just kind of doing her, her book tour, and Woodsboro just happens to be one of the stops. 
I always love that shot when Gail's kind of talking right to the camera, mm -hmm. and then she backs up, and then her actual crew comes and, and no, follows I, her. No, I, I love this. I love this final shot, and I love this final monologue of hers. I think it's a great way to close the movie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yep, so all in all, like we've kind of stated from the beginning, um, this is this is a film that we we loved from the beginning, we kind of grew up on, and um, we certainly followed the franchise and, and uh, have been fans mm -hmm. fans ever since. So um, another another well done Wes Craven. Oh, for Craven sure. Film. I mean, like we said before, you know, Scream was really the the little movie that could it. Had a budget of fourteen million dollars. Ended up doing one hundred and seventy-three million dollars worldwide. Uh, that'd be the equivalent of roughly three hundred million dollars today, which, for a slasher, is just absolutely incredible. And yeah, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed our commentary for Scream. We're gonna be back next week taking a look at Scream Two. And then uh, we'll be back the week after that for Scream 3 and the week after that for Scream 4. So it's going to be kind of um, Scream movie month here with Sasha Studios. So, yeah, if you guys haven't had a chance to check out our films, head over to SlasherStudios.com and also um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're going to be all over. And like we said, we're also going to be um, one at a time. We're going to be posting these commentaries on YouTube for you guys to listen to. Otherwise, you guys can still be downloading them for free at gumroad.com. So thanks for checking these out with us, and it's been a good time. Yep. Oh, yeah. Scream's always a good time, so definitely looking forward to the, the next few shows. So um, until next time, everybody, have a horror-filled week. Uh -huh.